And all of God's people who are glad to be in his house said amen. And amen once more. And amen like you're glad to be in church on a Saturday evening. Give the Lord a big hand clap of praise right where you are. In obedience to him who died once and will never die again, who's been resurrected and whose name is above every name. That the mentioning of his name, the Bible lets us know that every knee will indeed bow and every tongue will surely confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Uh, to my good friend and brother from another mother, Dr. Howard John Wesley, to Dr. Williams and to the pulpit constituency of the Alfred Street Church, to deacons and trustees who are present with us, who partner with the pastor in kingdom building endeavors, to this marvelous choir from Tugalo. My God. Oh, wow, 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 wow. Uh, I want to tease you all for a moment. If I were at Antioch after that last election, I would say the doors of the Lord's church are open. Uh, amen. Thank God for their gift and for their leader, their director. Give him a big hand clap. Man, wow. Thank you so much. Thank you. To the members and friends of the Alfred Street Church, to ushers who stand so dutifully, to these musicians who play so skillfully, and to all of you who just love the Lord Jesus, good evening, church. Uh, I want you all to know I've been praying for Dr. Howard John Wesley, and I am so thankful that my friend had enough sense to tell everybody, I'm tired, I'll see y'all later. God bless you. I just thank the world of him for doing that. Uh, so oftentimes we run ourselves to the point where it's completely depleted. But I am so thankful for him and his walk with the Lord Jesus. Dr. Wesley, if you're watching, I love you with all of my heart. I'm praying for what will come Easter Sunday morning. I'm going to stream myself because I know God is going to kiss you in a mighty way. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, sound, if I could get a little bit more in these monitors just right here, that would help me. Thank you. 1 Peter 2. Verses 4 through 8, I'm reading from the thundering diction of the King James Version. One quick petition. Let the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. Peter writes, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a further description, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. He says, and that cornerstone is elect and precious, and that he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, he writes, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at his word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Say amen. You may take your seats. I want to use for a sermonic thought today while it's my time to teach and to preach. Those church folk are stone crazy. <laughs> Amen. Ushers, you may take your seats. 
It took place one day in chapel when I heard a discourse that stretched me theologically. Dr. Timba Mafiko, who is an Old Testament professor at the ITC where I was graduated from, made an interesting contention. Listen carefully. He argues that there is too much Jesus in church. Uh, his contention, ladies and gentlemen, is built on the theistic idealism that the church should be more God-centered and less Christ-centered. That we talk about Jesus so much, we've forgotten about God. He says we pray to Jesus, sing about Jesus, read scriptures about Jesus, and if you mention Jesus too much, folk will even shout about Jesus. He said in conclusion in that discourse, those church folk are just stone crazy. Ladies and gentlemen, not long ago I was in Jerusalem and I couldn't help but take note to the fact that while walking through the Holy Land, all I saw was stones. There were stones everywhere. The gates were made of stones. The walls are made of stones. The streets are made of stones. Big stones, little stones. Mount Carmel, Mount Harmon, Mount Pisgah, Mount Calvary. All, ladies and gentlemen, are stones. And as I took note of it, my mind could not help but say that maybe with the midst of the Holy Land being filled with Arab Muslims and Jews and Hindus and Christians, I believe God was screaming from the top of his lungs. Don't miss all of these stones. I argue even today as we sit on a Saturday evening, cool, calm, and collected, that when you really take the moment to analyze the Christian faith, really we are a bit crazy. I don't care what you say. Uh, we are here today with a book in our hands that was written by, oh, maybe some 40 different writers over 1,600 years. You haven't met any one of them but believe what's in the book. Wait, to make it even crazier, you believe that some God way up there loves you so much way down here that he touched you with a finger of love this morning, woke you up, gave you the activity of of your limbs, put seeing in your eyes, hearing in your ears, clapping in your hands, walking in your legs, breathing in your lungs, and you are corona free. Ladies and gentlemen, you are here because you believe in your hearts that he turned water to wine in Cana, made blind men see, a lame man walk, deaf men hear, and somehow some woman who'd been hemorrhaging 12 long years pressed, his, pressed her way through the crowd, touched the hem of his garment, and got well. I don't care what you say, it sounds crazy, but I believe it. Ladies and gentlemen, as we take a look at the Christian faith, either you are crazy or you should be somewhere else. We believe he shrinks tumors. We believe he opens blinded eyes. We believe he saves lost souls. We believe that he heals the sick. We believe that there's nobody who can love you like him, trust you like him, build you like him. We believe in a resurrected Savior, ladies and gentlemen, who is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we could ever ask or think. His power is unmatchable. His love is unfathomable. His grace is enough to make you cry. His love showers you. And on top of all of that, he can hear all of us call him and never get any of us confused. Touch your neighbor and say, I believe all of that. Here it is. <laughs> I'm about to shout myself, wait. First Peter, he writes, and as he chronicles this wonderful epistle, it is really a carryover from Matthew 16, where he declares, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. I want you all to know this right off the bat. Peter is my favorite disciple of the Lord's 12. He reminds me most of me. Peter is flawed to the nth degree. He is that Lord's disciple of the inner circle of Peter, James, and John. Uh, I like him. I have a personal passion for Peter. And it is because the Lord tends to use the worst of us to help the rest of us. 
Let me, let, me, let, me, let me argue it this way. Peter, if you made him angry, would still curse if he had to. Hold on, see, that's past some of y'all. You're extra holy. You're a part of the high priesthood. You've met Jesus. You no longer use profanity. But Peter could still cuss if you made him angry. Wait. And he was the Lord's disciple who carried a hook-shaped knife in his vestiture called a sea car. And if you pushed him far enough, he would whip that joker out and do some cutting. Don't you, don't you love a Christian with a Bible and a nine millimeter, really? Don't you, don't you? Do? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Peter is the Lord's disciple. And what he does in this entire letter is make certain that Christians know that if you love God, listen, you will suffer from time to time. Oh, uh, I wish I had at least a hundred of you who love God, but you know what it's like to cry sometimes. You've had to bury some folk you love. You've had to go through some things that cause you to weep. But just because you go through it, if it doesn't kill you, it always makes you stronger. Peter says to us, beloved, think it not strange when the fiery trials come, but for to try you as if some strange thing happened. But he says the resolve for you is to learn how to rejoice while you're going through it. Can I press pause right quick? For all of you who are comfortable, you've never had to suffer, never had to strain this first shout is not for you, but for everybody else who's been through stuff that should have made you lose your entire mind, you ought to help me thank God for keeping you through that whole thing, just for just keeping you and holding you. He goes further to tell us that not only are we to be steadfast in suffering, but he says you ought to be sold out to the Savior. Don't let anything change your mind. By the time he gets through dealing with these epistle-like pillars, he then lets us know in chapter 1, verse 13, that everything in Christ comes alive. Number one, we have a living hope. In 1 Peter 1, 23, we have a living word. And in 1 Peter Peter 2, 20, uh, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 8, we have a living stone. He lets us know that in Christ we are alive. He uses a metaphor that lets us know that we are stones, but he is the rock. You know what I find interesting? Some people, when they go through turbulent times, reach for things like Sir Rock and I Rock, all of that. I argue what you need is the rock. Tell your neighbor, you need the rock. Rock. Hold on. He, he, he shows us these stones. He says it six times in just the span of a few verses. He says that he is the chosen stone, the chief and cornerstone, that we are lively stones, that because we are lively stones, he is the chief and cornerstone who was disallowed as a stumbling stone and a stone that's been rejected. But the ones that they rejected became the chief of the corner, the pillar the one who holds everything together. And when I finished looking at this particular text, I contended, ladies and gentlemen, that Dr. Mafiko is correct. Christians are stone crazy. You showed up on a Saturday evening just to lift your hands in the house of the Lord. You can't see him, but he's got an eye on you. I wish I had everybody in here who knows God's been watching you and taking care of you to look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, you can call me crazy if you want to, but God's been blessing me, taking care of me, leading me, guiding me, ordering my steps. He's been blessing me the whole time. You can call me crazy if you want to, but I plan to wave and I'm not saying goodbye. I plan to cry and I'm not sad. I plan to shout and ain't nothing scary. I plan to run and ain't nothing chasing me. Is there anybody in here who loves my God. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, they may talk about me, but I am stone crazy. I love the Lord with everything in me, and I'm going to keep loving him until the day I die. What's in this text? What's, what's in this passage, church, that ought to make us say, this is crazy? Listen carefully, because I want to borrow your intellect. Number one, 
Listen carefully. We believe in a rock that's been resurrected. Uh, there's a difference between a tombstone and a living stone. Uh, a tombstone tells you who is dead. But a living stone boasts on one who is no longer dead but is alive. I argue, ladies and gentlemen, that churches who are in love with Jesus ought to be the loudest, rowdiest, uh, all kind of commotion going on. It is because our God is alive. He no longer needs a tombstone. He is, ladies and gentlemen, a living stone. Here's the stone story from verse 4. He says to us, number one, he receives us like we are. Uh, can, I, can I ask you this? I know you've been in church for a while, but can I just ask you, what were you like when you first came to Jesus? Uh, listen to me. Listen. Uh, if you cannot remember what you were like when you first came, it's because you haven't come yet. So let me, let me stretch you. Let, let me just stretch you a little bit. I just asked a question. Wait, hold on. Think about it. What were you like when you first came to Jesus? Wait, can you borrow this as your testimony? I may not be perfect, but he has brought me. Uh, I heard that. Uh, that's your story too. From a mighty, mighty, mighty long way. Not only does he receive us, ladies and gentlemen, but there are others who reject him. I want to say this while I have this mic in this pulpit of my friend. Everybody that is talking about God ain't bragging on yours. Please know, ladies and gentlemen, that we do not fathom or even embrace the idea of the universal fatherhood of God. Listen to me. We are all God's creation, but we are not all God's children. You have to have a birth certificate that says, I have been born again. For everybody in here who has met him up close, look at a neighbor and say, neighbor, can't nobody do you like Jesus can. When you get through, ladies and gentlemen, not only do, do, does he receive us and others reject him, but they disallow him. That's what the text says. To the point they crucified him. But y'all, here is the best news you're going to hear all day long. They crucified him and he died. Uh, it was a bloody mess. It was horrible. But here is the mistake they made, Dr. Williams. They took the stone off the cross and put that stone in another stone and covered it with another stone. And then they thought that the stones that they had around this stone could hold this stone in. But this stone caused the earthquake. This just for those tectonic plates, those big stone ships. And when those stones got to shaking, all kind of stuff started happening in Jerusalem. And the Bible the Bible records this one truth that ought to cause your heart to rejoice on a Saturday evening at about 640. He's alive. Ladies and gentlemen, I argue today that the shout of the church is not the robes the choir wears or the music the choir sings or the drums that beat or the music that plays or even the sermon the preacher preaches. The Christian mantra that ought to be the shouting news of the church until the trumpet sounds and the rapture is this he's alive did you hear what I just said it doesn't have to be Easter Sunday morning for you to shout about that you serve a living savior I want to listen I want to make sure I say it over and over he's alive did you hear what I just said he's alive uh the angels recorded it Here's what Gabriel told the women who came to the tomb. You seek the living amongst the dead. He said, you too late, boo. <laughs> He's alive. Wait, hold on, hold on. Peter and John saw him. And then the Bible says over 500 at one time witnessed it. Uh, when I was in Jerusalem not long ago, uh, something really interesting happened. They took us to the garden tomb where Jesus was buried. Uh, it was the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea in the garden next to Golgotha the hill, the place called the skull. Uh, and so when we got to the tomb, they let us go in six and seven at a time. And so I went in with a couple of people and then as I was coming out, another group was coming in. 
And as they were coming in, one lady that I was unaware who she was looked in the tomb and then told everybody, hey, there's no body in here. I want y'all to know I took great joy <laughs> in telling her, you had to come all the way to Jerusalem to figure that out. Honey, I know he lives because he lives in me. I wish I had about 300 of y'all in here who would just shout on the fact that he is alive. Hold on. Not only do we look crazy because we believe in a rock that's been resurrected, but hold on, watch this. We are also people who believe that he uses pebbles as priests who are filled with a portion of praise. Watch this. I am so thankful, ladies and gentlemen, for the Afrocentric scholarship I was trained with. Uh, I, I, have, I have come to grips with the fact that Christian scholastic honor does not have to be German. It does not have to be white. It can be African American with thick lips, nappy hair, and an intelligent brain. Hallelujah. Come here, stay with me. Uh, one, of, one of the men who trained me in school, his name was Dr. Jonathan C. Jackson. He was a, a Tlickian existentialist. And one particular day, he had read for us the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. You know, where they shout, Hoshana, Hoshana, you know, Hosanna, Hosanna, you know, save us, all of that. And so some of the church folk got mad. So they told Jesus, listen, tell your folk keep that noise down. And Jesus said, if they hold their peace on a day like today, the rocks will cry out. And so when Dr. Jackson finished reading that, one of the students that, that was in my school with me went up to, his, went up to him with his Tolithian existentialism and said to him, do you really believe that rocks can cry out, Dr. Jackson? He said, do you really believe that? And Dr. John C. Jackson says him, I will never forget. He said, what fool will wait long enough to find out? He said, I plan on praising him every time I get a chance. I wish I had about a hundred of y'all in who say, I'm not going to let a rock or a tree or anything else have a chance. I'm going to bless God while I have breath in my body. Hold on, watch this. I'm almost finished. Check this out. When you get to verses 5 and 6 of chapter 2, you will notice, ladies and gentlemen, two particular metaphors Peter uses to describe church folk with. Number one, we are a holy house. And number two, we are priests. Everybody say holy house. Now say priests. Stay with me if you can. It's interesting because in the Old Testament, Dr. Williams, God ordered a house to be built for the people. But in the New Testament, the people make up a house for God. We are a group, listen to me, of literally stones that make the church of God who and what she is. Oh, you ought to take a look around the room. Don't touch nobody this time. Just look, because all of us are pebbles in the Lord's kingdom. Hold on, there were no big bricks or no little bricks, all just pebbles that make up the whole house. What's interesting, ladies and gentlemen, is this. These pebbles are priests, and the priests have one job, that is to bring the sacrifices unto the Lord. And because he has already died on the cross, you don't bring a lamb or a bullock or anything else. You bring one thing unto God, your thanksgiving and your gratitude for all God has done for you. If God has done nothing, then you have every right to fold your arms, cross your legs, look so diddy, and I'll catch you tomorrow if you come to church. But if God has done things for you that you know what took God to do you owe God at least one thing a thank you you've been holding all week long I'm preaching so good wait I don't want to stay too long when I got to tell you all this the job of the priest listen carefully is to keep the fire on the altar burning listen carefully if there is no fire in church, it's because you showed up without a flame. Yeah. 
Uh, I was preaching one Sunday at the Antioch church. Church was boring, wasn't nobody clapping. Folk didn't really want to be there. Choir sung the same old songs, you know, just one of those Sundays. And so one lady told me, Pastor Adolph, I didn't feel the spirit move today. Church was boring. I said, that's because you showed up without the fire. Your job is to show up with enough fire to light up your whole row. Okay, wait, it's time for a pew check. Tell your neighbor, if you could only see what God has done for me. If you can see the doors he's opened and the ways he's made and the things he's done and the times he's forgiven me and the moments he's blessed me and how he's taken my resources and blessed them and stretched them and how he's taken my family and put his hand on. I need to preach to about a hundred blessed folk right quick who can't hold your peace when you think of the goodness of the Lord and all he's done for you. Your hands automatically wave. Your soul automatically shouts. Woo! I feel a shout in me. Look over at a neighbor and say, neighbor, you have no idea just how good God has been to me. Tell him he's forgiven me for sins I know I committed. Tell him he's looked beyond my faults, seen every one of my needs. Tell him he hasn't just put a roof over my head, he's blessed me like crazy. Who am I preaching to? If that's your testimony, throw both of your hands up and tell God right quick, hallelujah in this place. Wait, I must caution you. Whenever you worship God and give God gratitude that is proper, other folk are going to think you are crazy. But that's because they wasn't there when God blessed you like he did. I've, I've got Bible record to go along with it. David sees the Ark of the Covenant returning to Israel and the Bible says he pulled off his royal vestiture and just wore a linen ephod and danced all around the whole city. So much so till Michael looked out of a window with disdain. I argue friends, if your worship does not work somebody else's nerves, you probably are not worshiping God at all. Your thanksgiving ought to be so radical and so real until people who normally sit by you say I ain't sitting by you no more that didn't take all of that you didn't have to do all of that you embarrassed me and that's when you ought to tell them if you didn't wake me up you can't shut me up if you didn't heal me you can't kneel me if you were not there you don't understand my testimony who am I preaching to I just need about 25 of y'all right quick to tell somebody when I think of the goodness of Jesus Jesus and all he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. I frown on churches and ministries who have laid our elders aside. I'm, I'm, I'm 53 years old, and I frown on churches who shove aside folk with gray hair. Hold on, we need our young people. Yes, we do. Come on, man, we need you. But hold on. Leave mama and them right where they are. Leave Sister Pearlie Me Hudson where she is. Don't you move them. They are living ancestors. Uh, they shout differently. They worship differently. They are different. Their experiences and encounters are different. But I frown on churches that shove them aside. Here's why. I believe there's something burning in their bosom that the current church needs. Our current church needs music to help it worship. But when you've been through what they've been through, you make your own song. Help me, Holy Ghost. I highlight this because there was a woman at our church, her name was Mother Katie Mae Timms. She would walk into church with an air tank. She suffered from several pulmonary illnesses, but she didn't let that stop her from worshiping her God. She sat on the third row to the left. If you sat there, she was going to slide you down. 
Uh, that was her seat, no matter how packed church was. And, 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 and what would happen is she would come in and she wouldn't worship at first. She'd listen to the deacons do devotion, then she'd kind of get a little warmed up, you know, a little rocking, and then choir got to sing two or three more songs, and she might wave a little bit. But by the height of worship, she would take off the oxygen thing. She'd go to rock it and clap it, and then when the worship was hot and high, she would literally dance up in front of church. They would have to come fan her. She would move the people that's fanning her. And then after church, she would just sit down and just collapse. Several times we had to call EMS because we saw she was going to turn purple on us, so we had to call EMS. And so one Sunday, I asked her, why did she do that? She said, baby, when you get my age, you don't know when it's going to be your last time. So she said, what you saw me do was I was saving my Thanksgiving up so I could give him all that I had. Can I ask you, is there anybody who's been saving a hallelujah? I just want about maybe 150 of y'all who've been saving a thank you Jesus all week. You hadn't let it out yet? Can I tell you what you ought to do? You ought to light this place up with a spiritual fire. Lift your hands in this house and tell the Lord, thank you for who you are in my life. Lastly, we not only believe in a stone that's been resurrected, we not only believe in pebbles that are priests filled with praise, but lastly, we believe that there is one stone who keeps everything else together. I'm through when I say this. You can make it without money, because I've been broke a whole bunch of times. You can make it without some people. In fact, you better off when some folk leave. Listen to me. I'm about to shout myself again. But listen, you cannot make it without Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ helps you keep everything together. Is there anybody in this house who's lived long enough to know that if you have Jesus, you have enough? Listen to me carefully. Peter says that he is the chief cornerstone. The same stone that the builders rejected and disallowed, God made him elect and precious. I looked this word precious up because I knew I was coming to preach for Dr. Howard John Wesley. And I discovered that it's mentioned twice, same root word, same tense voice and mood, same Greek morphology, layman syntax. It literally means to be honored, to be highly esteemed, to be like none other. In other words, the Lord took Jesus' life and made him like like none other, that there is nobody like him, that whether you look in heaven, on earth, or even in hell, you will never find a match for the maker that you love who is your master. Ladies and gentlemen, let me hurry to my clothes. That's enough time for my first sermon. Let me tell you all this. I rushed to work one morning. I got there early. It's a Tuesday. I promise you I had mail stacked everywhere. I told my secretary I don't want to be disturbed. I get Get there really early, the telephone rings. Sister girl then took a coffee break. I don't know where she went. She just left. I mean, she must have went and invented Starbucks. So I'm there by myself, and the telephone is ringing off the hook. I don't want to talk because I'm in there, and I'm trying to get some stuff done. So the phone is ringing, getting on my nerve, Dr. Williams. So I answer the phone with a rush in my voice. I say, Annie, I'm going back to church. I'm going to help you. And a faint female voice came over the speaker and she said is this the pastor hey y'all can I be human for about 30 seconds I want to lie so badly I want to tell her no <laughs> y'all too holy let me talk to y'all I want to say no he's not available just yet but I couldn't do it I'm at church I said yes ma'am this is he she said I watch your broadcast and I have a question for you I said go ahead she said my husband went to prison and came out a Muslim he said to me we should not worship Jesus we should not pray to Jesus we should not talk about Jesus but what do you say y'all I was a wonderful way to start my morning I'm crazy I don't care what you say I told her I said baby let me tell you one thing there is nobody in heaven, earth, or hell like him. I said, if you kill him, he rises again. If you tell him he can't, he'll show you that he can. He has all power in the hallow of his hand. When he walks, worlds are created. When he talks, galaxies are formed. He is God wrapped in a body. He is human enough to feel my pain and God enough to heal me. He speaks to storms and makes water stop 
that lay down and makes the wind wrap it up like a scroll. I said, and when he died, even heaven had to admit that two suns can't shine at the same time. The S-U-N had to fold it up while the S-O-N got a chance to sunshine. She said, well, shouldn't we worship him? I said, every day of my life, I plan to lift my hands and bow my knee because there is nobody quite like him. Nobody loves like him. Nobody saves like him. Nobody heals like him. Nobody blesses like him. Nobody strengthens like him. Nobody cares like him. Nobody wipes a tear like him. Nobody shrinks a tumor like him. Nobody makes a crackhead a deacon like him. Nobody turns people's lives around like him. Is there anybody in here who loves him with all of their hearts? Wait, I don't want you to say it because your neighbor is saying it, but I want you to say it because you stone crazy your doggone self. Shake your neighbor by the hand. Look at him right quick while you got a chance and say, neighbor, I love him with all of my heart, with everything in me. I've come here to worship him in spirit and in truth. Yes, yes. Find one more hand. Find one more hand. Uh, shake it like you're not afraid they have coronavirus. Hold it like you've been born again. And say, neighbor. They think I'm crazy, but I plan to bow my knee every time I get a chance, and I plan to call on his name every time I can. Is there anybody in here who doesn't mind worshiping him like right now? Can I tell you what you ought to do? You ought to lift up your hands and open up your mouth and just tell him thank you for everything thing you've done thank you for every way you made thank you for dying in my place ain't he all right I said ain't he all right say yeah. say yes oh I feel all right anybody here know that he can't nobody do you like he can don't fool me now, but if you know uh, that can't nobody love you like he can, uh, shake one more neighbor's hand and hold it like you got a testimony. Look, I'm square in the face. Y'all still looking at me. I want you to find one body, one person next to you. Uh, look, I'm square in the eye and tell your neighbor these words. Can't nobody do you like Jesus? Can't nobody, can't nobody, can't nobody heal you like Jesus? Can't nobody, can't nobody, can't nobody save you like Jesus? Can't nobody, can't nobody, ain't he all right? Say That worship touched my soul. I hope it touched yours as well. Listen, I want to thank you for watching, for worshiping, and for being part of our witness today. If the word of God and the worship moved upon your heart and you want to continue to support the great things that God is doing at Alfred Street, you can give electronically, online, through our app, or even our text to give option. I once heard a sermon, and afterwards someone said, is the sermon done? And the usher's response was, the sermon's over, but it has yet to be done. You just received a word from the Lord. Worship's over. Now let's go live the word and get it done. It's Pastor Wesley. See you next worship service.